My name is Tom Libby from the class of 1973, and I'm joined by Jeff Bleich from the class of 1983 and Carl Nelson from the class of 1973. We greatly appreciate your coming, and we hope you find this worthwhile. I'm, I'm glad personally to see there are so many people interested in, in cars and the automobile industry in the United States. So we're basically going to divide, divide this into, into, into three sections. I will start it off, and I'm going to provide you with a sort of a landscape, a broad overview of what's going on in the U.S. industry today. And then um, Jeff Bleich is going to talk specifically about autonomous vehicles, and he has a couple of videos that are, that are fabulous, and it's very, very real world about AVs being on the road right now. And then after that, Carl Nelson will speak about the uh, reality of the availability of minerals and other items versus the, um, the legislative goals for the industry. And um, so, uh, and after that, uh, we will definitely be open for questions. But um, so let me jump right into it. First of all, let me just, you may be wondering, you now who is this guy? Why does he think he has the right to talk about automobiles? So um, I did go to business school after Amherst, and then I went to work for a very large automobile manufacturer based in, as you might suspect, Detroit. And then I, um, <laughs> Then I um, uh, went, I, I, was, I was actually with that manufacturer for 11 years, and then I went to work for a very prominent automotive uh, market research company, and was there for 13 years, and now I'm with uh, S&P Global uh, Mobility. S&P Global uh, used to be called Standard & Poor's. It is a financial services company, as you know. Uh, in March of 22, S&P Global acquired um, the company that I worked for before, which was called IHS Market, and so now S&P Global Mobility is the automotive component of S&P Global. Um, so uh, with that, I'll jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I won't jump right into it. I'll do it this way. Yes, good point. <laughs> we, we, we just tried this a second ago and it worked. Yeah. Where do I point it? <laughs> yeah. Just raise that whole bar. Just raise that whole bar. Yeah. Yeah, go a little more. That's good. That's great. That's great. Okay. I think the batteries might have just died. So, so, but this. But you can see that it's working, but. Yeah, but. Oh, the, maybe it's frozen. I think it might be frozen. Hang on. Can I try it like this? Yeah, I think you're. There we go. Okay, now go back. Okay. So let's let's try this now. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Okie doke. So um, uh, I said I was going to provide a broad view. So this is actual historical um, market market share for the fuel types offered in the United States. And, and actually, before I get into that, I should explain to you where the data come from, where the data come from, because you might be wondering that. So anyway, um, S&P Global Mobility buys from every state every month all new and used vehicle registrations. So when you go to register a new vehicle with the Secretary of State, you get a license plate, et cetera, et cetera. We buy those, all of those, from every state every month. It's extremely expensive, and, um, but at any rate, it's fabulous data because it is not uh, based on any survey, on any sample, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers you're going to see are actual registrations. Now, somebody might ask, uh, so is that the same thing as sales? Well, it's not. It's similar to sales, but just so you're aware, the way sales work is a, when a dealer uh, sells a unit to an individual, the dealer electronically sends that sale to the manufacturer. Those sales are then aggregated and they're reported to the press after the, after the month is over. 
So, um, and frankly, what happens in the industry is that both dealers and manufacturers will manipulate sales. They do that because of incentives um, and for various reasons, but we bypass dealers, we bypass manufacturers, we buy the regs, the registrations directly from the states. So it is extremely reliable data. When there are lawsuits, to give you a quick example, if a manufacturer wants to terminate a dealer or hire or put in a, uh, fill an open point with a new dealer, they will always use our data because our data are solid. And, and again, it is actual numbers. So, so that's what you're seeing here. So and at any rate, this first slide is um, historical market share. And you can see on the x-axis there the time. So it's by quarter. So the green line. Yeah, good. The green line is um, electric vehicles. So you can see how it's been going up. So um, actually, if you go back uh, prior to 2018 and 2017, it was in the 3% range for a long time. And then what happened was in August of 17, uh, the Tesla Model 3 was launched, but there were a lot of production issues with the Model 3. So the volume did not really launch up until 2018. And you can see how the share begins to really take off in 18. And also in um, uh, January of 2020, uh, the uh, Tesla Model Y was launched. You can see after that the, how the EV line goes up. A couple things here. Um, you can see hybrid is the, uh, the blue line that's actually up above. And by the way, we classify, we classify as electric vehicles, those vehicles that are powered solely by electricity. So if there's a gas support system in our um, structure, it goes into hybrid. But also, the, the red line is gasoline. And the red line, by the way, is linked to the right-hand axis because it was so large we had to use two axes. But you can see gasoline going down, but it's still very, very strong. But the main point here is just to point out that EV continues to gain share, and it is now in the 7, seven to 8 percent range, depending on um, uh, what time period you use. So I just wanted to give you that. That's, that's the reality of EVs right now in the United States. Okay, so then this is showing within EVs in the United States, what's the share distribution? And obviously the big blue section is Tesla. But um, you can also see um, how Tesla's share, and on the far right there is the share in Q1 2023. You can see how Tesla's share has been going down. And also there we listed there and they're co-coordinated the brands that are second, third, fourth in EVs, uh, led by Chevrolet, Ford, VW, Hyundai, Rivian, et cetera. But uh, the main point, and also by the way, an interesting sidelight, um, Chevrolet uh, is that orange uh, section right above the blue. You can see how there in 2021, how it goes down to almost a zero. You may recall, you may be aware, there was a major problem with the uh, Chevrolet Bolt and they recalled everyone that was built. And it was, frankly, it was a, it was a bad publicity issue for GM. But this shows how a manufacturer can recover. Because look at how uh, the bolt has come back. And that is, is based uh, purely on the bolt. So just a, a side anecdote. But you can see there for yourselves, the others, um, how they're doing. And also, frankly, if you look way over on the left, I know there's no numbers there, but Tesla had been in the 80s. So they're coming down in the 60s. Every time we get new data, to be candid, Tesla comes down. As more models come on, uh, Tesla will continue to go down, to be candid. But still, 63%, 50 40 it's still uh, very, very strong. OK, so then this is a rather extraordinary um, set of data, in my opinion. This is the EVs that are coming. And the key part of this slide is up at the top. That's the total number of EVs that will be on the market in that year. At the bottom is the breakdown by manufacturer. Um, but what's amazing is if you look at those numbers up at the top and you look at 2023, by the end of this year, there'll be 74 EVs on the market. That means basically models that are available to be sold. So by December 31st, there'll be 74. But two years from now, there'll be 151. So we are seeing a tsunami of EVs coming. And this is not sort of, uh, you know, well, maybe they'll come, maybe they won't. Our forecasting practice um, has the specifics of these models in terms of wh who the manufacturers, where they're going to be produced, what's the powertrain, what's the size of the engine, what's the body style, so on. They have it down to the month of launch all the way out for several years. So this is based on very, very solid data. But this, this is, points out, frankly, the inevitability of EVs coming to this market. So the whole sort of discussion, well, is it really? Yes, it is here, and there's no discussion. They're coming. So with this, inf with this information, what we've done is we've then created this. So this is our forecast for EV uh, sales, which is the green line. And you can see that by the end of this year, well, we, we show 6%. It's actually going to be a little bit above that, as I mentioned. But it's going to go up by 25. It's going to be 16%. And then by 2030, well, first of all, in 2028, EV and gas are going to cross. So in 2028, for the first time, EV will actually outsell gas. And then in 2030, EV goes up to 43%. And by 2035, EV goes up to 71%. So again, these are based on those data I just showed you. And what they do is they get all that model data specifically, and then they basically aggregate it up 
into fuel type. And you can see here also, by the way, hybrid, which is that gray line that goes up and then sort of levels out. Hybrid is, um, uh, hybrids are doing very well now. Um, they are, however, in the long term seen as a bridge. They are not seen as a long term power uh, fuel type um, for the industry. So that's why you see that leveling off. I will say one interesting, and then I'll shut up, but one interesting anecdote about, hybrid, about hybrids is that um, if you own a hybrid, the, uh, uh, specifically a plug-in hybrid, the percentage of those owners of plug-in hybrids that go to an EV is about 34%, which is pretty robust. So that means about a third of hybrid owners, plug-in hybrids, will go to an EV. Gasoline owners, we call them internal combustion engine or ICE owners, the percent of those that go to an EV is 5%. So that's a huge advantage for manufacturers that have a strong hybrid lineup, and I'm specifically talking about Toyota, which started in hybridization several years ago, and now is hybrids across most of their models. But anyway, um, and then you can see uh, gasoline continues to come down. So anyway, just that's our forecast. Um, so then I, this is, I, I hope you can read this. I, I hope you can read this. I realize it's a small type, but the reason I'm showing this, this is on the y-axis is monthly payment. And I should mention where we get this from. So I mentioned that we buy the registrations from every state. We then send those registrations to a, an affiliate of ours, TransUnion. TransUnion appends six financial metrics to every reg. We then get the data. So this monthly payment data is very, very robust. It comes from TransUnion. And then on the, y, on the X axis is the volume. And this is the time period for um, uh, February rolling 12, which is March 22 through February 23. Now, you might say, why am I showing this to you? And anyway, all of these models that are shown on this chart are in the same category. We call them segments. So all, all the same size. They're all the same body style. This is compact utility, which is the category with the RAV4, the Equinox, the CRV, and so on and so forth. It's the biggest category in the industry, um, and all of these models compete. So they're the same body style, approximately the same price, same size. But what's fascinating here is, first of all, they isolate themselves, they fall naturally into, into four different groups, which I've highlighted with the circles. But the main point here is the EVs are in green, and look where the EVs are. All the EVs are substantially higher than the ICE, the gas vehicles in the same, this is the same category. So right now, the reality of the market is that if you want an EV, you're going to pay a premium for it. Now, long term, I know I'm aware of the advantages, but right, the, the short term issue is that there is a pricing issue with EVs. Um, and also, you can see there on the upper left there, which, that has all the EVs, the, um, the uh, EV6, the Mach-E, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly, you can see the Wrangler Hybrid is very, very strong, 918. But nevertheless, just to give you a breakdown within that category, but to point out the current premium you're going to pay if you have an EV, and the manufacturers are very, very well aware of that, and it is a, it is a challenge uh, in the near term. Okay, so then this is my last slide, but I wanted to just, I asked, I'm not involved in this part of the industry myself, but I asked a colleague if we have a forecast for autonomous vehicle uh, sales. And so he said, yes, so I got it off of our uh, website. And this is um, actual, this is, this is our forecast for AV, autonomous vehicle sales. And I will point out, I know Jeff is going to speak a lot about this, but a few years ago, you may remember, autonomous vehicles, it was, it was all anybody talked about. I mean, it was the thing. And is everybody going to be there by when, so on and so forth. And then it sort of receded. And so um, our forecasting practice, you can see, uh, has has taken that into consideration. We're not showing any actual AV deliveries. And this is, by the way, registration. So in other words, if, if it's a company that has registered the vehicle as an EV, and then they adopt it as an autonomous vehicle, we see it as an EV. But anyway, you can see the AVs don't start until 2026. So um, that's all I have. And what I'm going to do is um, uh, Jeff is going to speak for a few minutes, and um, um, then we'll move on. So thank you. So I'm, I'm Jeff Blanch. I'm the um, Chief Legal Policy and Safety Officer for Cruise, which is a fully autonomous and electric vehicle company operating in San Francisco, Phoenix, Austin, Houston, and Dallas right now. Um, and uh, uh, there are a couple questions that I always get about autonomous vehicles, and that's why I brought a couple videos. And I'm going to tap dance here for a second or two while Tom gets that set up. But the <laughs> Who was that? It's either Tom. <laughs> Tom or the one with the T-shirt that said "spicy" on it, but someone's going to help us um, get this get this on. The um, the two two questions that I frequently get first are 
um, how many you know, years, decades is it going to be before we start seeing autonomous vehicles actually on the street and, and operating? And second is, what are you going to do about, and then it's a whole variety of issues, you know, uh, scooters, bicyclists, motorcycles, um, small children, you know, crowds, um, you know, uh, different stoplights, different um, configurations. How are you going to manage all that? So um, what our company did was we thought... Um, uh, on the on the second question, which which one would you like to see first? Let's see. Why don't we start with um, um, the one? things we're gonna things we're gonna see on the on the road. Okay, that is that. There's one that has Phoenix in the title. Is it the other one? What, there's what, one that has Phoenix in the title. Is it that one yeah, or the other no, one? No, it's the other one. The other one. Okay. okay. Sure. sure. Me? Oh, can you not hear me? Can you hear me better now? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, what Cruz did? Sorry. Jesus. One of our engineers made this. Charlie was one of our one of our engineers, and you know he would go through the things each night, and he just wrote that himself. Do you want to do, do, you, want to do the, you want to do the second one now? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And this is kind of where we are today. All right, here we go. It's literally driving. <laughs> First riders ever. Just want to say, yeah. first in Phoenix. This is actually happening in Austin. We rode in Nessie. Moonwalk. Ginger was incredible. It's a uh, history in the making. It's People are very impressed. I know, it's nuts. <laughs> it's actually safer than a human driver. Safer than a human driver. driver. <laughs> I would ride this all the time. <laughs> there's, there's two more. This drive is just the start of what is a transformational change in the way we live our lives. Nice to be able to get somewhere and not have to have a driver. Mm -hmm. Just hang out with the people you want to hang yeah. out with. <laughs> kind of feel like you're a part of the future. It was very smooth. We really liked how for all the speed bumps and stuff, it would slow down. Good ride. That was super squad. That was incredible. Bye, Cass. Bye, Moonwalk. Bye, Moonwalk. We should do this all the time. Yes. So that the um, uh, the answer to the second question is um, William Gibson, the science fiction writer, uh, had, had the line, uh, "The future's already here. It's just not equally distributed yet." Um, so the future's here. I mean, these these vehicles are on the road right now. Um, Cruise. We've done two million miles with um, uh, ride hail, so paying passengers in the back seat of a vehicle with no one behind the wheel. Um, in San Francisco and, and Waymo, which is our principal competitor, has done a million miles in Phoenix uh, the same way, no one behind the wheel, people in the back seat paying fares. So it's, it's happening. And as I said, we've expanded into uh, Phoenix, Austin, Houston, and Dallas. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, <laughs> the other big question that we tend to get is um, why? Uh, why, are, <laughs> why do we have to do this? Um, uh, and I'll give you five reasons why I, I think um, autonomous vehicles will um, be picked up all across the country and will become the dominant form of, of uh, transportation um, over, over self-piloted vehicles. The first one is safety. Uh, 40,000 people are killed every year on American roads. Um, 
and uh, 400,000 more are seriously injured in collisions. Uh, and in 95% of those cases, according to NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, it's the same cause, which is a human operator and errors by human beings. Um, we get drunk, we get distracted, we get emotional, um, we get tired, um, uh, and, our, and our skills uh, tend to degrade over time. Um, machines don't have that issue. Uh, and, and so uh, when one driver gets a little bit better, um, doesn't make any other drivers better, um, but when you train a machine to be better, every other machine um, gets the same benefit, becomes better and better. Uh, so our, our commitment was that we weren't going to be operating until we could outperform a human ride hail benchmark, uh, which we uh, measured in combination with um, researchers from the University of Michigan and, and from Virginia Tech, and um, we measured how well humans drive and then we compared it to how well we're driving uh, and we are um, uh, on, on every metric that you measure uh, the frequency of, of collisions the severity of collisions um, and the um, and the accountability for collisions who's responsible for them uh, we've been exceeding the the human ride hail benchmark consistently sometimes by uh, nine times um, for example on accountability so um, based upon that, uh, just the, the fact that you could save basically all the lives that were lost in Vietnam every single year on American roads, uh, and even if you had like a 50% improvement, uh, you're saving 20,000 lives from, uh, and, and another 200,000 from serious injury, and worldwide, you'd save a million lives um, every year once this technology takes root. Uh, second reason is it's an all electric. Um, fleet, so I won't go into too much detail because others can cover that, but take billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, third reason is access. Uh, if you think about um, how, how mobility has been distributed up till now, um, there are a number of communities that have been underserved, particularly disability community, um, people who are um, uh, in wheelchairs, for example, um, have never been able to have a fully independent ride the way the rest of us um, who are who are able are able to just get in a vehicle and have your own space and be able to go where you want to go. Um, we've got a variant that you know you roll up to it, you press a you, you press your app, and the vehicle will roll right up to the curb. A ramp comes out, you can roll up, clip into the vehicle, and you've got your own own vehicle wherever you want to go. Um, for other groups, um, independence is also important. For those of us, you know, we're um, you know, uh, at, at our 40th, 50th, 60th reunions, um, we're starting to think about, um, you know, how long we're going to be able to continue driving ourselves. I watch my parents drive, and, um, you know, they're a menace. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm not even that good a driver right now myself. So, um, the ability to have um, autonomous vehicles um, create that independence where you can have your own car, your own ride, you can go wherever you want, when you want. Um, without being dependent on third parties. Um, and then just people who live in poor neighborhoods, um, they tend not to get ride hail because uh, taxi drivers think uh, it's an unsafe area, maybe I'll get mugged or I'm not going to get a very big tip, what's the point of going there? Robots don't get tipped um, and they can't be mugged. So they will go wherever they need to go and serve everyone equally. So there are a whole number of reasons about equity that I won't get into. Um, but those are just a few. Uh, on top of that, if you think about the driving experience, you know, I used to love driving, but um, now if you live in cities, uh, it's not that fun. It's just you're, you're sitting there staring at someone else's bumper and just moving, grinding through traffic. Um, it's rare that you really get out on the open road. And if you want to get out on an open road, you'll be able to do it in the future if you want your own car. But if you just want to get from place to place, and instead of doing this, um, you can be watching a movie, you can be sleeping, you can be doing work, you can do a whole bunch of other things. As some of my classmates know, uh, I was a diplomat in my earlier life, um, and um, I'll, I'll just tell you, life is better in the back seat of the car. It's just, <laughs> it's just good there. Um, and I think people will, will appreciate that. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, well, um, I, I, 
I, I can continue to go on with the um, with the benefits of this. I think the last one is just that you you really reopen cities. Right now, we consume a tremendous amount of space, parking spaces, parking lots, people having vehicles that are just a burden on them. They you, know, you pay a ton of money for them, and then they sit there in the driveway 98% of the time, or they sit in a parking lot 98% of the time. You're always trying to find a place to park, and you know they they they. Are, are a drain on us and if you just have vehicles that are available when you need them where you need them pick you up you'll be able to um, enjoy all the benefits without all the burdens of um, of that transportation there are risks um, and that was part of what attracted me to this role was to try and make sure that we um, uh, develop these in a way that served humanity as opposed to overwhelming us um, and there are risks with how this technology could be used in order to navigate. We know we have cameras, we have LIDAR, we have radar, we have sensors all over the vehicle that are perceiving everything in the surrounding area uh, that help us navigate. But, you know, if you want to use that for mobility, which has been our mission, um, then it's, it's a great technology. But, you know, any tool can be used for good or bad. You know, a hammer can build a house or it can break someone's skull. It just depends on who's using it and for what purpose. And this same technology could be used by autocratic governments in order to um, uh, collect data on every single person on every navigable space on the planet uh, and use it for social control or surveillance capitalism. Um, that seems like a darker world than the one that you know we have in our video. And so there's a race now largely between um, US manufacturers and Chinese manufacturers over who will dominate this market. It's about a $16 trillion global market. There's going to be a lot of investment by both nations in this effort. And the likelihood is that whoever gets there first and has the broadest distribution will be able to set some of the ground rules for what technology is allowed to be deployed and how it will be deployed. So um, being successful and being successful first uh, matters quite a bit, and that's been that's been our focus. There are a number of other challenges with respect to EVs that um, I'll, I'll defer to Carl on. I think the main ones that we anticipate are going to be um, first, you know, continuing to extend battery life, um, uh, having a supply chain, and particularly rare earths that will be sufficient to um, to, to supply a huge increase in demand for batteries. Um, the you know reducing the loss of um, um, uh, power and transmission, um, so storage capability will be an important factor, and then um, just being able to, um, to to manage such a rapid transition will be huge. So um, I think I'll leave the rest for Q and A afterward, and turn it over to Carl. But that's that's kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, as quickly as I can give it to you. Thanks. Sim simply shows what metals are being consumed by our brand new electric cars. And I, I certainly want to mention, I, I'm probably one of the most excited people in this room about autonomous vehicles. I've worked most of my career overseas. I've been in five serious car wrecks, and they're all human, all human error, no, no, no question about that. So I, I picture myself, hopefully someday, in a shiny electrical vehicle, uh, headed, maybe headed around San Francisco, who knows. <laughs> Look at what an electric car consumes relative to conventional cars. These, you'll often see these copper, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, carbon, and the rare earth elements. You'll see, hear them referred to sometimes as critical metals. I'm not going to talk about iron or aluminum. Those are widely distributed. They're not in, by any means in short supply. I'm going to focus really on these so-called critical minerals. And for electric cars, we're, we need about six times as much as we do for conventional vehicles. We, we do need to take that into con account when we're thinking about the environmental impact of our electric vehicles. It'll take six times as much energy to mine those metals for your electric car as it did to mine the metals for the conventional car. Rare earth elements out on the end aren't much by weight, but they play a, a large role in many, many aspects of electric car development. 
For those of you who remember Professor Fink's introductory chemistry class, that's the lanthanoid elements, and they have particularly strong uh, capability as permanent magnets. They're about a hundred times as powerful as uh, ferro ferromagnetic uh, minerals like iron, cobalt, nickel. I've been trying to come up with a slide that really brings home what we're thinking about when we talk about the electric vehicle transition that, we've, that we just saw Tom describe. And the slides I show, rather than focusing on U.S., all, will all have uh, information about worldwide consumption. So here's a slide that brings home for me just what it would mean to transfer, transform from internal combustion engines in the United Kingdom to an all-electric fleet, 31 and a half million vehicles. That would require twice as much cobalt as we produce in a year, three-fourths of the lithium production, and about as much neodymium and dysprobium as we produce in a year, and those are the two big rare earths that are most useful for, for magnets. So what do we, do we mine? How much metal do we mine every year? So this is worldwide metal mining, iron ore, 2.6 billion tons. That's the amount of iron ore we mine. Industrial, mag, industrial metals are an order of magnitude less. All those metals, copper, aluminum, chromium, manganese, the, all together are an order of magnitude less than the iron we mine. And then finally, the third big group, technology and precious metals. That's where the rare earths would be. That's where uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, etc. They're two orders of magnitude below what the industrial minerals are. Why is this diagram important? From my point of view, I look at copper, 21 million tons mined every year. If, if we're going to double the amount of copper production, that means an additional 21 million tons. Big copper mines produce 200, 250,000 tons of copper every year. So for me, coming from a mining perspective, that's 100 new big copper open pits to double the copper supply to our emerging electric vehicle fleet. I don't think we can do it. With respect to rare earth elements, and they're, they're cer certainly important, we've got, uh, and not only for electric vehicles, but for our defense applications, uh, for hard drives, for LED screens, all kinds of applications, there are only 270,000 tons a year. That's what the world produces. One big rare earth mine produces half of that. The biggest rare earth mine in the world, in China, of course, is producing 140,000 tons per year. When we were students here back in 73, for the cl class of 73, we're, the U.S. was the biggest rare earth producer in the world. And that same single rare earth mine is still in production today. We have, in the U.S., we have one rare earth element mine. We have one little cobalt mine in Idaho. We have one little nickel mine in Michigan. But we don't have to worry about anything like the increase in mining impact when we talk about the rare earths. A few additional mines would do a, go a long way towards increasing our supply. Where are these? elements coming from, where are these metals coming from? You'll see the U.S. big producer up there for oil and natural gas, of course, but when we get into our critical metals, copper, nickel, cobalt, etc., the U.S. barely makes the top three. You only see the U.S. down there for, for rare earths, and that's that one rare earth element mine in California that I mentioned a moment ago. Most of our copper worldwide comes from Chile. Most of our nickel comes from Indonesia. 
cobalt from the, Dominic from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, graphite, rare earths from China, Australia for lithium, platinum and platinum group elements largely still from South Africa. So as when we think about our electric vehicles, we do need to think about where we're sourcing those, those materials, not only for su supply concerns, but for social and environmental concerns as well. Let's move from production to processing. The plots get even redder. <laughs> Chile, that pr who produces most of the world's copper, ships most of that to China for processing. Australia ships all of its lithium to China. Indonesia ships most of its nickel to China. The Democratic Republic of Congo, the big, the big cobalt producer, ships all of that cobalt to China for processing. And sure enough, we ship our rare earths to China for processing as well. Here's anticipated demand, not just for elect electric vehicles, for the transition to electric vehicles, which you see there in green, but also for the electric networks that are associated with, with that uh, transfer in yellow. STEPS is the stated policy scenario. That's what governments have, have uh, announced they're going to do. SDS is the sustainable development scenario. That's following the uh, Paris Agreements of 2015. And then finally, we have the net zero, which we all hope will be the case when we reach 20, 2050. I want you to think about those 100 new copper mines that we would need to double copper production to get to 2x on this graph. 4x, 6x, it's, it, it just cannot happen. We cannot mine that much copper. The copper industry itself cannot, does not predict we could, we could expand at anything more than 3% a year, given the number of copper deposits that are, that are currently in the pipeline. That, that's the situation we face. Here are some, here's some cause for hope, a few, a few slides at any rate that give us some, some ideas or some cause for hope. Lithium ion cell manufacturing capacity plants, building lots more plants to build these, to build these batteries. Again, most of them are in China. So China's comply, supplying not just the supply, they're controlling the entire supply chain from raw materials mining through raw materials processing, through the construction of the lithium ion cells, and then finally to the construction of the electric vehicles then as well. And Jeff just mentioned that they're gonna be the major competitor in the, in the uh, switch to autonomous vehicles. More good news, the battery pack price is coming down. That's gonna help with the, the cost that that Tom pointed out, the high cost of vehicles. Another big development is the possibility that we can switch away from no, some of those critical minerals like cobalt, which you recall was from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We can switch away from co cobalt as, a par as part of the cathode uh, material used in, in, in batteries and switch to lithium, lithium phosphate. The cobalt nickel manganese uh, con consumption was, was largely due because of its en energy density. It, it provides more power per weight than the, the lith lithium phosphate. But that automakers are driving the change to lithium phosphate. And you can see these pr predictions by Bloomberg have fallen by 50% between two 2019 and 2022 in terms of what they think we're going to require it for cobalt going forward. This is good news.
Tesla just announced plans to switch its electric vehicle fleet from 12 volt to 48 volt architecture. That would be huge. Reduce that copper demand by as much as 75%. Now Elon Musk has a tendency to speak precipitously on occasion, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to watch to see if this, this actually happens. Recycling will become increasingly important. Absolutely, we can recycle all, all of these metals, but you can't recycle it if you haven't built it yet. And I'm worried about that first step. We gotta, we gotta get them built. There are new sources of critical metals coming on, on stream from, from what we would call unconventional deposits. We're finding, we're finding rare, earth, the rare earths, for example, in bauxite deposits, aluminum deposits. And even there's been some, some progress in, in planting species that preferentially uptake nickel and cobalt into the plant structure when they're planted on, on uh, anomalous soils, soils that are already anomalous in, in nickel and cobalt to begin with. And then finally, and again, in, especially for the, my classmates from the class of 73, we remember predictions, dire predictions, about the future of oil. As a matter of fact, I remember graphs like the ones Tom and I have been showing this morning that predicted that we'd be out of oil by the year 2000. That was, that was the prediction back in, in 2023, or, or in 1973. Then there's that famous bet by Paul Ehrlich, who was the author of The Population Bomb in 1968. He predicted all sorts of dire consequences and was take, challenged on those predictions by a business professor, Julian Simon, who said, well, pick any commodities you want. I bet they'll be in, I'll bet they'll be cheaper in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years than than you think they'll be, than they are now. And sure enough, Ehrlich's bet proved incorrect. He lost that bet and prices, prices did come down. So we're, we're hopeful that given the differences in predictions, we're gonna have, uh, have, some, have some positive changes for the future. This is a picture of Jim Mix, Mixter who stood up before this audience at our 40th reunion and talked about Big Oil's view for the future of oil, uh, oil consumption in, in the US. I thought that was a pretty brave thing to do, and when I talked to him just before, before his talk 10 years ago, I, I, I could tell he was having second thoughts. <laughs> now, we lost Jim a couple years ago, but the predictions he communicated on behalf of his longtime employer, ExxonMobil, have largely held up. Renewable energy supplied 8% of world oil energy consumption in 1973. It's only up to 11% today. And those are the most optimistic numbers I could, I could find. Some would argue that we, we haven't made a dent. Fossil fuel consumption is still 80, over 80% 80 of the world's energy. And remember, the world's energy consumption continues to rise. By 2050, when we all hope to be at net zero, where predictions are that world energy consumption will have increased by 75%. So the main points here, the takeaways, I don't think new mines that are required by this transition from an internal combustion to an electric vehicle fleet can reasonably become on stream, even to meet the 2015 Paris Agreement. Te technological breakthroughs offer some hope, and since we're all reflecting on our lives and ambitions and dreams of 50 years ago, I'm remembering how excited I was about going out and looking for uranium to fuel a transition in nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is 5%, under 5% of world energy production right now and has been falling. Uh, 
really, my friends, we, we, we've got to go back and look hard again at nuclear energy. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be here in 2050 when we're class of 73 celebrating our 77th reunion. <laughs> And we're going to be looking at world oil consumption still over 50%, which is what ExxonMobil predicts. Okay, thanks very much. We, um, we have, a, uh, I, know, I know there's an event at 11.30 that all, a lot of us would like to go to, but we do have 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, um, yes, Peter. Yeah, no, that, that, that's very true. And the, the price of autonomous vehicles is going to go down dramatically for a couple of reasons. One is one of the most expensive aspects of ride hail is, is paying for the driver. The second is collisions and insurance associated with it. Um, and, uh, you know, you drive those costs down. And then if, you know, as, as we're discussing, if you can get um, the price of uh, EV batteries down, much less expensive than um, buying fossil fuel to... Um, uh, to power a vehicle. So you add those all together and it becomes much more affordable for people. And then the shared ride hail and the fact that they're operated as fleets will also make them much more efficient. Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, right now, uh, yeah, so the, the, the question is, if you're a high school student or a college student and you want to get into the AV industry, what should you be studying? And then the, um, the, the second question is, what states are going to allow AVs to operate? Um, so on the first one, really, some of the most interesting work is being done in simulation. Uh, so it is artificial intelligence. It's just, you know, we, we do... Um, you know, a million or so miles in closed course, we do a few million more mapping and on, on the road, but we do, I can't even count how many a million miles, um, but we do millions of hours of simulation and our vehicles are actually being trained on screens now. Uh, and then we, and then we test them closed course. We do some, some driving on the road just to be sure. Uh, but the, the simulation is, is perfect. And in fact, if I showed you videos of a simulated environment and a real world environment, you'd, you'd probably have difficulty telling the difference. Um, at least I do. Um, and then the second question on states, the reason we, we went to California because we figured it's the hardest place to go. It's the hardest driving environment and the worst regulatory environment. And if you can make it there, you know, you can make it anywhere. Um, everywhere else is simple. Like when we went to Texas, um, you know, we were yeah, we're prepared for, you know, what do we need to do in order to move into Texas? And basically you say, we're going to try really hard. You know, that's it. There's like a form. It, it took about a minute. Um, I had to sign it and just say, we think we can do this, you know. Um, whereas California, we've, we've had to get like 20 different permits and lots of reviews. But, you know, but that every, every state is now of essentially open and the only reason no one's up in the northern part of the of, of the states is because you have to develop a different kind of heating element for your sensors in order to drive in snow and ice um, and that that's probably about a year or two away yes fred There, there's certainly potential, and I'm, I tried to emphasize in, in, in my talk that I'm, I'm open to, to, to all, all, all solutions, possible solutions, contributing solutions, re recycling changes in technology, et cetera. 
personally, although I admit there's potential, personally, it's hard to envision how it would copper mined from an asteroid could compete with the price of copper mined here on Earth. I'd all in the same vein be worried about mining the deep sea floor, which is another source that's being considered for 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 metals. Uh, but but we'll we'll see if we if we can do it safely, then uh, then then absolutely. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Well, um, just I, I actually am not in the forecasting practice at my company, so I did get I, I did get this from from our forecasting practice. But I will say, as I think I mentioned before, in terms of electric vehicles, they have specific information about the models that are coming, and, and it, it is very because the reason why they have that is because three to five to six years before a model is launched in the United States, all the suppliers have to bid on that project. So the suppliers are aware of these products, programs, three, five, six years ahead of time. And we have an extraordinary network with suppliers, and they provide us with that information. So um, there's a lot of confidence in the EV numbers. You know, today's 23. I mean, I, in terms of 25, 26, I, I, I can't speak for them literally, but I, I, I think they would be very, very confident. When you get out to 2035, there's, there's going to be things that are going to change between now and then. But in the near future, the share that we're showing for EV, again, in the next two to three to four years, and also bear in mind that the, the lead time for these programs of these manufacturers are, are very, very long, so that the, tw the 24, the 25 products are, are pretty much locked in already. So um, at any rate, I, I would say that in the near term, we're very confident about it. When you get out to 2035, obviously many things can happen. That would be my response. Yeah, we have time for just everybody's FYI. It's now 10 after 11. I'm going to, we'll take a few more questions. Yes, go ahead. You repeat repeat the question. Yeah. The <laughs> right. The the quest the question was can we can we precipitate or can we push a move towards lithium iron phosphate batteries and get away from the cobalt nickel manganese that we, we require? And I had one slide up that, that, that shows that's already happening. Currently, the battery, battery, lithium iron phosphate batteries are about, about half. They're already at, at close to 50 percent. and. The, the awareness of the automakers on the, the vulnerability of their supply lines is, is going to continue that push. So I, I, think, I think the reduction in, in demand for cobalt nickel manganese is already already underway. Tom, do you want to weigh in on that? Too? No. Uh, yeah, the, the, the second follow-up question was whether sodium-driven sodium bat batteries, the sodium cathode, would, would also be helpful. And the easy answer is, well, why not? I, I believe there, 
there's some issues of energy density, and in other words, how much power versus weight, and so that that begin begins to give you a balance that the that the that the engineers themselves will will think about the, the trade-offs. But it, it's certainly a potential way to go, and and sodium much much easier to acquire. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> Speak to this briefly. Yeah, the, the question was um, how do we address the cost issue um, and how we, are we going to be able to bring the costs down? And um, I, briefly, I, I can talk to this. I, I showed you that one slide that showed the, the premium, the monthly payment premium for electric vehicles. It is a significant problem. I just give you a very quick anecdote. Sergio Marchione, who was the uh, chairman of Stellantis, this is it's obviously several years ago, but uh, he introduced the Fiat 500e to the media. So this was wide open to the media nationally. And he revealed the car in his, in his comments. He said, please don't buy one. I lose $14,000 in every one I make. So <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's an ongoing issue. And um, one big unknown, at least from the outside, is, uh, is Mr. Musk's cost structure. And because he appears to be, again, this is from the outside, he appears to be making money, uh, whereas the, the legacy, the other manufacturers apparently are not making money. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And, and I think down the road, if there is still that cost issue, um, and I can only speak in general terms, the, the, go the government is going to have to step in to support the industry. And we'll, we'll see how that evolves. That's, that's all I can comment. I don't know if you want to say anything else. OK. We have time for one more question. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Curious about the the uh, automatic driving systems. I appreciate the safety that you're talking about, but from an ethical point of view, how do you choose? How do you program it to choose between hitting the kid on the right or the elderly one on the left? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that's. Yeah, and that. No, I mean that that is the the classic trolley trolley question. But um it turns out that you know the way the way the vehicles are trained they're they're trained to um minimize collisions period and they prioritize the most vulnerable road user. So they aren't saying well they seem to be near the end and you know we got to save this. <laughs> um Oh, they're 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 just focused on you know we 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 avoid pedestrian scooters people on motorcycles um, and you you uh, and and so they're they're getting better and better at being able to assess um, how quickly can I stop and where can I do the least damage. Unfortunately, it's eleven fifteen. Um, we appreciate your interest, but um, thank you very much. <laughs>